All right. Good evening and welcome to a special astronaut presentation that the McCullough Center is offering to mark the beginning of Massachusetts STEM Week 2020. This event features former astronaut and MIT professor, Dr. Jeff Hoffman, who will talk to us about the MOX experiment on board the Perseverance rover that is currently on its way to Mars. Hello, everyone. My name is Irene Porro. I am a director of the Krista McAuliffe Center for Integrated Science Learning at Framingham State University. I am also the lead of the Metro West STEM Education Network that is one of the regional networks that are coordinating STEM Week 2020. I want to take a moment um, because I know that there are several FSU alums uh, on, uh, with us tonight to welcome you and, and welcome again everyone who decided to join us tonight. Um, we are also probably going to be joined by a few more as we go on with the, present, with the introduction. So we'll be uh, looking forward to sharing with you the great program we have tonight. A couple of words about Massachusetts STEM Week. Uh, this uh, one week series of events officially takes place from October 19th to the 23rd and is organized by the Executive Office of Education and the STEM Advisory Council in partnership with the state's nine regional STEM networks. STEM Week is an effort to boost the interest, the awareness, and the ability of all learners to envision themselves in STEM education and employment opportunities. The theme of annual STEM Week is See Yourself in STEM, with a particular focus on the power of mentoring. So in this context, the Metro West Network offers a speaker series that highlights the need for diversity of identities and expertise in all STEM fields and showcases the diversity practice and occupations skills. And so as you can see on this slide, uh, we have organized three presentation for, presentations for next week, all featuring remarkable speakers, including on Wednesday, October 21st, Dr. Turner from the MIT Media Lab, who will speak about counteracting bias in the design of technology. Then on Thursday, Thursday a real, a really interdisciplinary team that will introduce a prototype for a pandemic tent to be used to administer the COVID-19 vaccine, we hope really soon. And finally, on Saturday, two young women in leaders in STEM and mentoring will share with us their strategies and advice. They will offer in particular to high school and college students their families and educators. So I hope that you all get a taste right now of these uh, 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 future talks. You are all welcome to join us next week and check our uh, event website to, to find out about more events we are offering for STEM week and also other organizations are, are providing this week, this coming week. And anyway, now to get really the formal start to our evening and our special presentation, it's really my pleasure to introduce Mary McDonald, who is a manager of planetarium programs at the McCullough Center, who will take us into the rest of the evening. Mary. Thank you so much, Irene. And I do hope that you have all um, take a note of that website, cmcenter.org slash events, which is where you'll find all of our events, but in the next week, they're all related to this STEM week series. So that's where you can find all of the events uh, that Irene just mentioned. Um, and another thing you will find there is you will find 
that we are offering the opportunity for anyone, members of the general public, to join some of our brand new uh, virtual educational programs that we've developed. So if you have children or you know children um, from first grade all the way up through high school, we have a few different uh, offerings during STEM week. Um, I'll, and I also want to let you know that, that STEM week is essentially the premiere of a lot of these virtual programs that we have been either developing ourselves or developing through collaborations over the past few months. So we are excited to announce the rollout of our virtual program series. We have a series of virtual missions, which have some connection to um, the missions that had been um, presented in our Challenger Learning Center at Framingham State. And we also have a series of live online astronomy programs, which have a little bit of similarity to uh, Astronites, if you've been joining us uh, for Astronites, but, but not really quite like that. Um, I can't really say too much about these programs now. We don't have time, but I hope that you will check out. I know we've given a lot of websites, um, Maybe we'll make sure to email everyone who has registered uh, with a little bit more information. But uh, our website for these virtual programs is cmcenter.org slash cmc online, as you see on your screen. And that's where you can find information about these programs and find out how you can book these programs for your group. Uh, and this, is, this goes way beyond STEM week. This is something we'll be offering uh, indefinitely. So, if you have more questions about that or anything, we will be taking questions at the end of the program. But what you are all here for tonight, you're here for Astro Nights, Astro Nights Live. And some of you I know have joined us before, uh, but others I know are here for the first time. So welcome. Astro Nights Live is a series of live online astronomy programs. We have a real focus on um, illustrating what's visible in your night sky in an effort to get people uh, to head outside and look at the real thing. We're also focused on current events um, and tonight's program is a really great example of both of those. Uh, going forward, starting with tonight, Astro Nights will be offered monthly and you are very much encouraged to come back again for, for our future programs in the coming months. Uh, we don't have time to talk about everything we wanna talk about tonight, but that's why you should come for the next Astro Nights program. Now, um, I do recommend that to get the best experience for at least my part of the program that you do view in full screen. Uh, I invite you to take a moment to make sure you know how to go into full screen mode. Zoom is constantly changing and this may not be what it looks like anymore, but I do believe it's still up in the upper right hand corner of the window. Um, I, I may be, you may have noticed that the chat functionality is available. Um, at the moment, I may turn it on or off at, at some points during the program, um, you, just in terms of what people find, uh, what people find appropriate at given times. But what is gonna be available um, definitely is the Q&A functionality. So make sure you can locate that. Uh, we will be going through questions, uh, myself and Dr. Hoffman, at the end of the program. Um, so feel free to enter questions. Um, I, I might try to wait until the end. Uh, we're not going to be uh, stopping too much to answer questions, but you are free to enter your questions at any time. All right. And I just wanted to let you know, uh, there are a lot of resources related to tonight's program. We've put up a lot of uh, fun resources about Mars and the Mars 2020 mission. And all of that can be found on our event page. So uh, we hope you'll check that out after the program for all the many, many more questions that you may have. Um, and finally, to get into our program, uh, we do like to often start with a question. So here's tonight's question that I'd like you all to think about. If you're joining us as a group of uh, people together, we'd like you to really start a conversation with each other. So the question is, what is the atmosphere of Mars like? Is it just like Earth's atmosphere, but thinner? Or does Mars have no atmosphere? 
does the atmosphere of Mars contain no oxygen? Um, is the atmosphere of Mars mostly carbon dioxide? Now, those of you who are joining on Zoom, I do actually have this in poll form. So I am launching that poll right now. So let's see what people think about the atmosphere of Mars. All right, let's get those votes in. Just a few more seconds. I'm gonna give you three more seconds. Three, two, one, enter your responses. And that's all the time we have for the poll. Okay, let's see what people said. Uh, most common answer, the atmosphere of Mars is mostly carbon dioxide. Um, this is, of course, one of these questions where I'm not going to tell you what the right, right answer is, but I will tell you the ones that are not really true. Um, the first two are not really true. Uh, the atmosphere of Mars is thinner than Earth's, but it's not just like Earth's. It's not just like a thinner version of Earth's atmosphere. And it is definitely not true that Mars has no atmosphere. Um, with some planets, it's kind of tough to say whether they have an atmosphere or not. Uh, you know, it kind of depends on what kind of scientist you are. But pretty much everyone, um, pretty much everyone uh, does say that Mars, of course, has a atmosphere. It is very thin, though. Um, now, the the last option, the atmosphere of Mars is mostly carbon dioxide. A lot of you said that, um, and I would say, yeah, that's true. That's a that's a that's a Good answer. Um, but as for number three, the atmosphere of Mars contains no oxygen. Um, I'm going to not say whether that's true or not. So maybe we'll learn a little bit more about that uh, later tonight. So we know that it's mostly carbon dioxide, but we don't know if it's true whether it has no oxygen. All right. So now um, I'm going to turn my video off, uh, but I'll turn it back on later. And we're going to take a look, uh, as you may imagine, at our night sky. All right. Well, you should all be seeing. Well, Mary, you've got to stop sharing uh, what you have up and then start sharing again the new one because we're still seeing what is the atmosphere oh. of Mars like. All right. That's just the way Zoom works. It's a peculiarity of Zoom. Night sky? Do we have the night sky yet? There we go. Well, we have a sunset. I wouldn't call okay. it night. It's a sunset. Right. Um, and in fact... Oh, this is not quite the right sunset. In fact, I, yes, here we go. Here is tonight's sunset. All right, everyone. So you are looking at the sky tonight, actually a little while ago, around 545. I always do like to start around sunset because I, I think that's a good way to orient yourself to which direction is which. We're looking towards the south um, and the sun is setting uh, between south and west. So let's let that sunset. Um, for those of us in the Boston area, it was a little bit rainy today. You maybe didn't get such a great view of the sunset, but maybe tomorrow night uh, you'll be able to see uh, the planets Jupiter and Saturn uh, still very bright. They've been visible all summer. So those of you that joined us uh, for Astronights over the summer, we did talk quite a bit about Jupiter and Saturn. And you can um, find those past episodes on our website and our YouTube channel. But that is of course not what we're here to talk about tonight. We're here to talk about another planet. And without further ado, we're gonna go locate that. So to find that planet, we're gonna turn towards east. And I promise you, you're gonna see it. It's not gonna be hard. So there we have it, 
It's seven o'clock p.m. I, I don't think I mentioned that, but it's uh, in our sky. It's currently seven o'clock p.m. So just about a little a little before real time. And there it is, Mars, the red planet. Um, I will tell you very briefly that this is a little bit unrealistic in terms of what Mars will look like. Uh, it will look very bright. You will see the red color, but my planetarium software tends to use sort of the size of the object uh, to indicate the brightness because it's, it's not as easy to show how bright Mars is um, on a computer screen. I'm telling you, you really have to get out there and see it yourself. It won't necessarily look like um, a disc, like a circle, the way you see it here. Um, it'll look just like a really, really bright object. Um, you will be able to see a disc shape if you look at it through even a small telescope. And that's really the way we um, can tell the difference between stars and planets in telescopes, is that with planets, you can see a resolved disc. So here's Mars looking very lovely. Um, and you will have, I promise you, absolutely no trouble looking, look, uh, locating Mars in your night sky. But we often do like to use the stars to help us. So if for some reason you couldn't find Mars, you might look out for a handy dandy little uh, shape uh, of a square in your night sky. That is the constellation Pegasus. And right now it is looking uh, pretty nice, kind of pointing directly down at Mars um, with this square uh, section of, of Pegasus. And then uh, just a little bit to the to the north, we have the constellation Cassiopeia, which will appear in the shape of a W. So just two fun, easy to find constellations to look out for um, in your sky when you're also seeing Mars. Now this is around 7 p.m. It's It really could not possibly be easier to see it. Um, not only is it very, very bright and easy to spot, but Mars is going to be visible essentially all night long. So those of you who have already seen Mars, um, you know what I'm talking about. You just look out the window and it's right there. So in the around sunset, you'll be seeing it in the east. Um, and I just wanna quickly show you the path that Mars will follow across the sky. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, um, I'm gonna trace out the path of Mars and that's gonna make it appear green briefly. So uh, just bear with me. And let's go forward in time. We're gonna go forward by one hour at a time. And we're gonna see how Mars appears to move across the sky. So here it is at around seven. Um, there's Mars uh, later at about eight. And you see that it's just gonna get higher and higher in the sky. It's gonna move across the south. It'll be sort of dead center in the south around midnight. And then it will start to head downwards towards morning. And you'll see it just as big and bright in your sky um, in the west as it's setting right when you wake up. I've been getting Mars coming right in my window in the morning um, when I wake up. And just interestingly enough, uh, while you're seeing Mars set in the east, sorry, while you're seeing Mars set in the west, you'll see the planet Venus come up. Um, over here in, I don't know if you can see that, over here in the east. And Venus is actually even brighter than Mars right now, uh, but it's, 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 it's Mars we're talking about, but Venus is, is actually brighter. So really quickly, why is Mars looking so bright right now? Well, you may have heard, I know there's a lot going on in the news right now, so I wouldn't blame you if you have missed this, uh, but Mars may be in some minor news stories uh, because Mars is at a position right now that's known as opposition. And we're gonna see what that looks like out in space. So opposition occurs when uh, the, the sun and Earth and Mars are lined up with Earth in the middle. Um, and this essentially marks the point where Earth and Mars are closest together. It's not exact though, because the orbits of Earth and Mars are not perfect circles. So the actual, um, so this, this was the 13th a couple days ago. That's the actual day of opposition. But the two planets were truly closest together uh, for this orbit um, back on October 6th. So that wasn't actually opposition, but that's the day they were closest together. 
The true opposition, as I said, was the 13th. And I hope you can see from this graphic why this makes it so, why Mars appears so big and bright in our sky. First of all, because it is closer to Earth um, than, than it would be. And I'm going to show you the opposite of opposition, right? The opposite of opposition is conjunction when basically Earth and Mars are on opposite sides of the sun. Um, and in this arrangement, obviously Mars is about as far away from Earth as it can be. Whereas with opposition, it's as close to Earth as it can be. So it, it's closer, it appears bigger, it appears brighter. And also because if you just look at the arrangement of the planets, think about us on Earth at night on the dark side, right? When we look out at the sky at night, we see Mars perfect, dead, dead ahead. Um, and you know, during the daytime, we're looking this way, no Mars. So two reasons why Mars is really, really easy to see and also why it's visible for the entire night. Now, really quickly, um, I just wanna mention that you may have guessed that these oppositions, that they occur every two years, by the way, because it takes, it takes Mars two years approximately to complete one orbit for every two orbits that the Earth completes, all right? So every time the Earth has completed two orbits, Mars has only completed one. So these oppositions occur just about every two years. Um, and this is also when launches of missions to Mars are usually planned. Um, so it's not exact. So like, for example, we don't launch the, we don't launch the spacecraft on the day of opposition, but we launch them around opposition. So that's why we don't have missions going to Mars just anytime we want. And it's also why it sometimes appears that several missions launch around the same time. So back in July, just ahead of this opposition, we had several missions launched. There was a mission to Mars launched by the United Arab Emirates, their first uh, official mission to Mars. There was a Chinese mission launched and there was NASA's Mars 2020 mission. And that brings us to our next guest. Um, without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Jeff Hoffman, who is a former astronaut and a professor of practice in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, and he has also contributed to the Mars 2020 mission uh, which is why we have invited him here for Mars Mania. So Dr. Hoffman, um, I invite you to turn on your camera, say hello, and uh, take over. Okay, well, thank you, Mary. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to just uh, take over with a, a little bit uh, to add what Mary just said about why Mars looks so bright. And let me share my screen to do that. Hold on just a sec and we will. Uh, right, so uh, Mars and MOXIE. Uh, MOXIE is an experiment which is on the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover and uh, you'll hear a lot more about it in the next 20 minutes. But just to uh, uh, further what Mary was saying, um, I'm going to give you a graphic illustration um, over what's been happening over the last eight or nine months. And that is uh, back in March, Mars was much further away. And this was the actual size as you would have seen it from the Earth. And then as it gets a little bit closer and comes towards conjunction, you can see it's getting bigger and bigger. And now the relative size uh, is also what affects the brightness. Um, and so Mars is uh, not only directly opposite the sun, but it's big and bright. The entire uh, disk of Mars is illuminated. And by the way, I saw one question, why does Mars look so red? Well, the surface of Mars has a tremendous amount of iron oxide, which we normally call rust. And you all know that rust has a red color. And uh, therefore the, the light that's reflected from the sun back towards us is predominantly uh, reflected in the red part of the spectrum. And that's why Mars uh, is the red planet. And of course that led to, because of the association with red blood and Mars became the god of war. 
uh, at least in uh, Greek mythology and Roman mythology, but we're not going to deal with history now. We're actually dealing with the 2020 rover, which is on its way to Mars. And of course, what do we have to worry about when we think about Mars is how are we going to get Mark Watney home? I hope all of you have seen the movie, The Martian. If you haven't, it's uh, pretty realistically done. Uh, you may remember that uh, the uh, the crew has a what we call a Mars ascent vehicle. They they landed on Mars, and this is the vehicle which is going to take them back off the surface of Mars to uh, link up with their rocket, which is going to take them back to Earth. Uh, they were going to originally spend a long time on Mars, but along came a dust storm. Uh, this is a picture of a, a weather front with a dust storm on Mars. We, we have a lot of dust storms on Mars, and I'm going to show you briefly that scene from the, uh, from the movie of uh, why, why they had to evacuate. Whoops. That is the wrong picture. Hold on just a sec. Um, oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, um, in the movie, um, I'm going to go back to playing from current slide. There we go. Um, you, you may remember that um, uh, Mark Watney is left for dead on Mars, uh, an accident. Uh, but in fact, he's not dead. He figures out how to survive on Mars, how to grow potatoes on the Mar in the Mars uh, uh, soil, and eventually uh, takes his rover and makes his way to another Mars ascent vehicle, which has been put on Mars, uh, waiting for a future crew to come. And, uh, and he is able finally to get off the surface of Mars, as we see here. Okay, and of course the movie ends happily. Um, he does make it and he gets back to Earth. But what they don't really deal with in the movie is uh, where did all that propellant come that uh, allowed this, this uh, Mars ascent vehicle to get off the surface of Mars? How much propellant do you think you need? Well. You know, we, we don't know exactly what this ascent vehicle is ultimately going to look like when we send people to Mars, but uh, we know enough about rockets that if we have a crew of six people, uh, that rocket is probably going to have a mass of about 50 tons, and about 80% of that mass is going to be propellant. You have fuel and oxidizer. The fuel is probably going to be methane. Uh, which is much lighter than oxygen, and, and the methane will be burned with the oxygen uh, fuel, liquid oxygen. And so about three quarters of that propellant is going to be oxygen. That's 30 tons of oxygen. And uh, where are you going to get that from? Well, of course, you could take it all the way from the Earth. But here's the problem. If you want to take anything from the Earth and land it on the surface of Mars, You've got to put, if you, well, one ton, for instance, if you want to put one ton of anything on the surface of Mars, you have to put about 15 tons into Earth orbit. The, uh, the propellant that's going to get you to Mars, the structure, the heat shield. So, of course, some things we have to build on Earth. I mean, the, the vehicle itself, the, uh, the habitat that they're going to live in, the spacesuits, all that thing. We can't make those things on Mars, at least not now. But dumb old oxygen? Um, if we want to send 30 tons of oxygen to the surface of Mars, we've got to put 450 tons into low Earth orbit. And that's... Uh, a tremendous amount. Uh, 
wouldn't it make sense if we possibly could to make that oxygen on the surface of Mars and save all of that, uh, those launches from, from the Earth? Because that's the idea behind what we call ISRU, in situ resource utilization. In situ means where you find it. It's another way of essentially saying, let's learn how to live off the land, which explorers have done since time immemorial. If we have resources where we are exploring that we can use, whether it's food or water or anything else, it's much better to use those resources than to have to bring them all the way with you. Um, if we were to have to launch 450 tons into low earth orbit in order to get those 30 tons of oxygen to the surface of Mars, it would take three to four launches of a Saturn V class rocket. Saturn V could put about 125 tons into or low Earth orbit. Um, and they were expensive rockets, billions of dollars for each launch. Um, and that's similarly the, the new space launch system, which NASA has developed. It's, these are expensive rockets. So again, we could save uh, billions of dollars by making oxygen on Mars. And that is what uh, Mars is all about. Um, now, how can we make rocket propellant on Mars? Well, if you could find water on Mars, um, maybe we could make propellant out of that. And in fact, about 10 years ago, we had the Mars Phoenix mission, which landed uh, in a, a very north uh, northerly latitude on Mars, and, and it, was, it was not a rover, it was a lander, but they did have a scoop on it. And when they scooped away the first couple of centimeters from the surface uh, of Mars, the surface regolith, underneath they found ice. And we do believe that there is a lot of water on Mars, mostly in the form of ice, we believe. Mars is very cold. And if we could access that water, then in high school chemistry, everybody electrolyzes water. You put two electrodes into the water, you hook it up to a battery, and lo and behold, hydrogen comes out one side, oxygen comes out the other side. And uh, if you could fill your fuel tanks with the hydrogen and oxygen, you could then burn them in a rocket engine. Problem is that uh, water uh, or the ice is mainly, uh, as I said, at, at uh, the northern latitudes getting near the North Pole and presumably in the southern latitude as well. Um, and that's not the easiest place on Mars for people to go to. It's much colder. I mean, Mars is cold in general, but it's likely that early human missions to Mars will probably go closer to the equator. Um, in addition uh, to which, uh, if you're going to harvest that ice, you've got to set up a mining operation. You've got to dig through the regolith, which is, we don't really talk about soil on Mars because soil implies that it has organic uh, components so that you can grow things. And of course, in the movie, The Martian, um, uh, Mark Watney had to turn that um, <coughs> basically of the Mars regolith, which, which had no nutrients into it, into soil, and he fertilized it with his own excrement. I won't go into any more details, but if you've seen the movie, you understand that. Uh, so you've got to dig through the regolith, you've got to then uh, dig through the ice, you've got to bring the ice up to the surface. It's going to be very dirty, mixed with regolith. You've got to filter it, turn it into water. Um, and someday I'm sure that we will be able to do this, but uh, it's not the easiest way of uh, getting uh, oxygen. Uh, what we think would make more sense, at least for early missions, is to take advantage of the fact that, as you heard in, in the quiz, which you did at the beginning of today, um, 
the Mars atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide. This was confirmed by the Viking landers, um, you know, a quarter of uh, almost half a century ago. Uh, Mars atmosphere is very thin. It's only about uh, roughly 1% of the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere, but it does have an atmosphere and it's about 95% carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, you see the chemical formula CO2. So there's plenty of oxygen in that carbon dioxide if we could get at it. And that's what our experiment MOXIE is all about. It stands, this is an acronym, Mars Oxygen in situ resource utilization, and you know what that means now. It means getting the, uh, the materials on Mars rather than have to bring them with you. Uh, so Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, MOXIE, M-O-X-I-E. So what do you have to do in order to harvest oxygen out of the Mars atmosphere? Um, well, I'm gonna show you exactly how we're gonna do that. First, let me give you a brief introduction to the rover and to where MOXIE is. MOXIE uh, is uh, inside this uh, rover, the P Perseverance rover. Perseverance externally looks very much like the Mars uh, Curiosity rover, which uh, is currently on the surface of Mars. It's still working, still exploring, but it has a new set of experiments I'm not going to go through the details of all the experiments, but uh, most of them are dedicated to analyzing the geology of Mars and to looking very, very closely at the, uh, the Mars regolith and rocks on Mars, which they'll be able to drill into, to see if there's any evidence of past life, fossil single cell organisms like we find here on Earth. Because remember, when the solar system was first formed, we believe that Mars was very similar to the Earth. I don't have time to go into a detailed history of Mars, but we believe that, there, that Mars actually had a much thicker atmosphere. It had, there are, there's all the evidence that, that we have collected indicates that there were, was probably liquid water on Mars. Um, Mars lost that, um, Maybe in the Q&A period, we can talk more about that. Uh, I, I don't have time now, but the point is that during these first billion years or so of both the Earth and Mars, life formed on the Earth. And since the conditions were very similar on Mars, we believe to the early Earth, um, maybe life evolved on Mars. That's, that's a question which has been plaguing scientists for decades. And uh, Mars 2020 is gonna try to answer those questions. Uh, one of the interesting experiments, which is new for the first time, uh, we have a ground penetrating radar, which is designed as, as the rover moves along the surface of Mars, it, it can penetrate below the surface to look at the underlying uh, strata of, of rocks. And if by any chance there is ice or water down at these lower latitudes, maybe we'll be able to find it. So that, that's exciting. Um, MOXIE is located inside the, the rover, most of it. And now let me show you how we actually are gonna produce oxygen on Mars. Well, first of all, you've got to suck in the Mars atmosphere. And we know that there's a lot of dust in the Mars atmosphere. You can see a dust devil up there, uh, which was recorded from a previous uh, mission. So the one external thing that we have on uh, the rover is the, we have a dust filter, a HEPA filter. And um, so we pull in the Mars atmosphere and it comes through that filter. And so hopefully we won't get any dust inside the rover because it would, it would muck up our experiment. Now the Mars atmosphere is very thin as you've heard. So the next step we have to do is to compress that atmosphere. And we have a, a compressor to do that. It's, we call it a scroll pump. Um, the, this inner spiral goes in, the, in this spiral and they, they rotate around and and they compress the Mars atmosphere and all that's driven by a motor. So we have a motor and a compressor. 
Now we have a, a compressed Mars atmosphere at maybe half the density of, of Earth's atmosphere. And now, remember I told you about uh, electrolyzing water to produce hydrogen and oxygen. Well, it turns out you can electrolyze carbon dioxide as well. It's a lot more difficult. You have to heat it up to about 800 degrees Celsius uh, run it over a bed with a special kind of nickel catalyst, at which point the carbon dioxide molecule gets rid of one oxygen atom and you're left with a certain amount of carbon monoxide and oxygen, which give, uh, picks up some electrons. Um, and then uh, this is the electrolysis unit. So it passes through a very special kind of electrolyte uh, with uh, scandium. Uh, uh, there's a uh, scandium doped zirconium ceramic electrolyte, which has the unique property that it doesn't allow just free electrons to pass through it, which is the way most batteries or fuel cells work it's only allows oxygen ions to pass through it. So those, the oxygen, which has been uh, freed from the carbon dioxide and picked up some electrons, and we, we then put a electric field across this, uh, that passes through the electrolyte where it comes to the anode, it gives up its extra electro, uh, electrons and forms oxygen molecules, uh, O2, which uh, then come out. Now, we don't have anybody to use that oxygen. There's, there's nobody to breathe it uh, on Mars. So we're basically just going to analyze the oxygen to make sure that it is in fact 100% pure uh, and then release it back to the Mars atmosphere where ultimately it will recombine with the carbon monoxide, which we're putting into the atmosphere and we'll end up with the CO2 that we started with. So ultimately we're not changing anything on Mars, but um, all of this requires electrical power because you have to take electrons, put them on the oxygen, take them away from the oxygen. Uh, and any electrolysis process, whether you're electrolyzing water or carbon dioxide requires electrical power. So that's basically the way the system works. Um, this is just one layer of an electrolysis unit. Uh, the actual MOXIE experiment has 10 layers, which we stack up, and that's the rough shape of it, just so that you, you can see. And, and uh, it's a rather complex system. As I said, we, we have to filter out the dust. Um, we have a limited amount of power available because we're on the on the rover and, and the rover only has about uh, 300 watts available and, and and when moxie runs we basically use almost all of that uh, the other experiments basically have to shut down um, and many other things involved with compressing the atmosphere with heating it and I won't go into all of the gory details but we've spent a lot of time, uh, testing this system in a laboratory. And just to show you the sort of problems that we worry about, uh, yeah, we'd like to produce as much oxygen as we possibly can, but if you produce too much, uh, you can take some of that carbon monoxide, strip the oxygen out of it, uh, and end up with carbon. And that solid carbon you can see on the right side will coat the inside of, of the uh, electrolysis unit. And basically, if that happens, we're out of business. So we have to be very careful how we operate that. We wanna produce as much oxygen as we can, but not too much. And so, as you can imagine, we've done a tremendous amount of testing in the laboratory. This is one of the laboratories at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, and this is a joint experiment between JPL and MIT. They, they basically built the experiment uh, and we, we specified what we wanted. They built it. They did some preliminary testing. Uh, we're gonna do more testing at MIT and we're responsible for operating it on the surface of Mars. 
This is a um, uh, full-size mock-up, um, 3D printed mock-up of the MOXIE experiment, just so you can get an idea of the size of it. That's me, by the way. And this is the actual MOXIE uh, before it was totally buttoned up and uh, put into the rover. This is the... Um, the motor, this is the compressor, and this is the electrolysis unit. And then there's a lot of electronics and sensors and a whole bunch of other stuff because remember this experiment has to be run um, autonomously on Mars. We, we can't uh, basically watch it while it's working because it takes data a long time, you know, 10 to 20 minutes to get to the earth from Mars. and. Uh, and we can only get the data back certain times of day. So we have to uh, basically program the computer on MOXIE to uh, not only run the experiment, but to be on the lookout if anything is going wrong and shut things down before any damage is done. Because of course, if the uh, unit gets damaged, uh, we can't go there to fix it. This is uh, the MOXIE experiment being loaded onto the Mars rover. Mars rover ready to go. I showed you this picture before. Uh, one other thing I'll just mention, uh, for the very first time, there's gonna be a, an atmospheric flying vehicle, a helicopter, which this rover is carrying to Mars. And so with, for the first time, uh, we're gonna fly in the atmosphere of another planet. Uh, it'll be very exciting. We should get some spectacular uh, video from this. This is the heat shield, which is going to uh, protect the uh, whole rover as it goes through the Mars atmosphere. The thing about landing on Mars is, although the Mars atmosphere is very thin, it's still thick enough to uh, heat up anything that's entering the Mars atmosphere. Uh, at planetary entry speeds, just like things entering the Earth's atmosphere. Unfortunately, the atmosphere is so thin that although we use a parachute to slow us down during part of the re-entry, um, you can't land on a parachute like we do here on Earth. And so you have to eventually drop the parachute and land on rockets. And uh, these are the rockets, which will basically, it's a sky crane, which will lower the, the vehicle down onto Mars. I've got a short video uh, that I'll show you uh, how all that works. But anyway, here's the experiment when it's entirely packaged. This circular ring is what we call the cruise stage. And that's what will take care of the whole system uh, right now while it's, it's on its way, because it was launched at the end of July. Uh, when we get close to Mars, we'll dump that uh, cruise stage, and then we have this lower section here, uh, This is uh, which, which will actually land us on Mars. Here it is being encapsulated under the, the nose code shroud, and there it is um, on its way on the Atlas V rocket on the way out to the launch pad, and we had an absolutely beautiful launch at the end of July. We're now on our way, the, uh, the rover looks good. Uh, I'm happy to report that uh, just yesterday, we actually turned on MOXIE for the first time uh, just to make sure that it survived launch. It appears that it did, and we've got some data back, which we're now starting to look at. Uh, we're not producing oxygen, of course, on the way to Mars because there's no carbon dioxide, we're operating in a vacuum, but at least we get to see that the experiment survived and is basically healthy. So here's uh, about a three minute video that will just take us uh, from launch on Earth. This was actually done for the Curiosity rover, but it's very similar for uh, Mars Perseverance. There we're dropping the cruise stage, as I mentioned before. Um, Remember, all of this is completely autonomous because Mars, uh, we, we can't get signals to Mars in real time. It takes uh, many minutes to get there. So now we are entering the uh, very thin upper regions of the Mars atmosphere, which is going to uh, cause the heating. You can see how hot it gets. That's uh, almost 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. 
but the heat shield uh, should survive. And once we finish the heat the heating stage, we will drop the heat shield. And we, we pop the parachute at uh, about three times the speed of sound. There goes the heat shield. The parachute is slowing us down somewhat. But as I said, we're still going too fast to land on the surface. So eventually we drop the parachute off. And now this is that sky crane, which has its own rocket motors. It's gonna get close to the surface of Mars. You can see the rover is suspended underneath. And it, it will try to guide us to the, the right place. And then when we get close enough to the surface, it will deploy the rover on cables, we saw the, um, the wheels deployed there. And as soon as it gets a signal that the uh, rover is on the surface of Mars, it cuts the cables, flies away. And all that is hopefully gonna happen on February the 18th of next year and we will be on the surface ready to turn on and start producing oxygen. Here's where we're gonna land in Jezero Crater. Uh, you can see the, the I don't know, that's not this crater, that's just a, a small crater, uh, but this is the, the outside rim of Jezero Crater. Uh, quite fascinating because into that crater, back when Mars had liquid water, uh, there was a, a river coming in, and this is the river delta, and these clays and carbonates in the delta here on Earth are the perfect materials you need to preserve fossils. And so if there are any fossils of early Mars life, this is the kind of place where we would hope to find them. Uh, one of the new technologies which we're going to use uh, because Jezero Crater, you can see it's, it's uh, it, there, there's a lot of rough area around here, which you want to avoid when you're landing. Uh, so we need some intelligence in the lander so that it, if it picks up rough terrain underneath, it can move and avoid that terrain and land in a safe area. So this is a new technique, which is going to be uh, pioneered with this uh, Mars 2020. Anyway, uh, just finishing up uh, to remind you that MOXIE is just the demonstration of a technology which we will ultimately, we hope, use to produce oxygen for a human mission. The idea is you will land the Mars Ascent vehicle on the surface of Mars uh, with an empty oxygen tank so you don't have to take all those 30 tons from Earth. And then uh, you remember there's 26 months before between launch opportunities. So you have about 14 months to fill up that oxygen tank. And once it's full, you can confirm that we're okay to send humans at that next opportunity. And we can calculate uh, how much more oxygen this system will have to produce than MOXIE. MOXIE is producing around six grams per hour, maybe eight grams. That's enough to keep a small dog alive, but not enough for a human mission. We actually are gonna to need to produce about three kilograms an hour. So that's several hundred times more oxygen than MOXIE is producing. It's gonna be a much bigger experiment, probably one ton in itself. And instead of the 300 watts that MOXIE requires, they're gonna need 25 kilowatts. So in-situ resource utilization requires a lot of electrical power. And that's something NASA is working on how we're gonna get all that power. But uh, we hope that MOXIE will pave the way. And so ultimately we look forward to it 
time when humans are going to land on Mars because Mars is such a fascinating planet that we need to explore it as well as is humanly possible. And that means ultimately sending people there. As good as our rovers are, and I love our Mars rovers, there are just things that they can't do, places they can't go. And so my only advice to the first generation of Mars explorers is, hey, people, don't forget your moxie because you're going to need it. And that's basically what I wanted to show you about what's uh, happening on uh, this Perseverance rover with our MOXIE experiment. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And uh, hopefully we have a little time for questions. Mary, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoffman. That was fascinating. Um, there was so much there. Uh, and I think the way we're gonna do this, just, you know, we're gonna take a few minutes of questions. People have already started asking some. So I'm just gonna read some to you if you if that's all right with you. And I'll do my best to answer. All right, um, so people continue to ask questions in the Q and A. Um, if you put them in the chat, I think we've got everything in the chat handled, but for now, let's try to stick to the Q and A so we can see them all in one place. Um, I'm gonna go with my first question. Um, from Olivia, why does it get so hot when you enter the Mars atmosphere, even if Mars is such a cold planet? Well, uh, Mars, uh, it, it's the same thing when you're approaching the Earth. You're, you're going at uh, uh, tens of thousands of miles an hour. That, that's a lot of energy. And you have to remove that energy so that you can land. Um, and uh, when you hit the atmosphere, whether it's the upper atmosphere on Earth or the atmosphere of Mars, uh, the atmosphere generates friction. And that does slow you down. But of course, friction heats up. And that's exactly what's happening. You're converting the kinetic energy of motion, this, this fast velocity, into thermal energy. And so the secret is to have a heat shield so you can dissipate that thermal energy while you're slowing down. Um, the fact that the surface of Mars is closed is, is kind of, you know, you're not on the surface, you're, you're up in the atmosphere. And, and uh, the fact that, that you have all this atmospheric friction slowing you down is what really heats you up. By the way, when you're landing on the moon, you don't have to worry about that. The moon has no atmosphere. So you don't need a parachute. You don't need a heat shield. You do all your slowing down just with a rocket engine. Mars is the worst case because the moon, you don't have to worry about heating up, but you need a big rocket engine to reduce all your speed. On the Earth, you have to survive the re-entry heating, but then the Earth's atmosphere is thick enough to slow you down with a parachute so you can land just with a parachute. You don't have to turn on your rocket engines again. Mars, you've got, to, you've got to worry about the heating of the atmosphere, and then you use a parachute to slow down a little bit, but then ultimately you need to turn on your rockets again because the parachute can't take you all the way down to the surface. You would hit much too hard and, and be destroyed. So yeah, Mars is hard. Great answer and great question um, from the audience for that one. And I think it's a good lead into another question, which I'm sure a lot of people are wondering with all the challenges that you've just described, when do you think people will go to Mars or live on Mars? Well, I, I don't like to answer that question because it's not so much a technical question. I mean, we, we have the technology now that we could go to Mars, but it will be extremely expensive as well as risky. Um, more so even than Apollo. And, and we know it took a, a very special time in history. It was the Cold War and it was a competition with the Russians. And uh, so the country was willing to make the huge investment in the space program and developing space technology that allowed us to go to the moon. Uh, I don't think we're going to have another Apollo program in that sense. And so 
there's two things that have to happen. I mean, NASA needs, uh, or whoever else wants to go to Mars, has to figure out how to do it a little bit more affordably, but it's still going to be very expensive. And then it ultimately is going to come down to pol politics and economics. Um, you know, what, what's it going to take to convince uh, the Congress, if it's going to be a government program, uh, to, to put that money uh, to make it happen? Or, I mean, Elon Musk and SpaceX, they, they want to go to, he wants to go to Mars. Um, if, if he has enough money and the ability to do it, more power to him. Uh, but I don't know when that's going to happen. You know, people talk about maybe we'll do it in the next decade. Maybe we will. I'd love to see it, um, but it's going to be more a question of politics and economics than of technology. Great question. Um, hmm, okay, so I have a question here, and the person can type a little more if or ask something else if, if I'm not understanding it, but is what will Perseverance do if it is hovering over an area without any smooth spots? Will its mission be over? And I'm assuming um, what this means is about will the rover be yeah, able to- Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's exactly why they developed this terrain relative navigation. Uh, it, it's similar to uh, during the Apollo program, the, the first few missions to the moon they purposely chose very flat areas, which were somewhat boring for the geologist. It turns out that the more geologically interesting an area is, the more danger it is to land there. They developed precision landing techniques. Uh, that was demonstrated on Apollo 12. They landed very near the, uh, the, one of the old surveyors. And that gave people the confidence that, that we could actually land in much more challenging areas. Um, and of course we had human pilots who, who helped make that happen. Now we've got to do it all by uh, artificial intelligence and autonomously. So we, we believe that, that there's enough smooth areas in, in the vicinity of the, the Jezero crater that we'll be able to find one but if something goes wrong and uh, they land on, on top of a, a big boulder and fall over on their side, the mission is over. So let's hope that the terrain, well, it's, it's more than hope. I mean, it's been demonstrated on, on numerous occasions in simulations and in tests. Um, and we have ever con every confidence that, that it will work. But if it doesn't work, um, you know, uh, that's the end. Mars is hard. And we have lost Mars missions for, for various other reasons. Yeah, uh, that was me knocking on wood. Um, great answer. Um, so general question uh, we want to ask you, um, how long has MOXIE been in development? How long does a project like this take? Okay, uh, MOXIE itself as an experiment was approved for flight on this mission in the summer of 2014. But the development of the technology that Mars is used has been underway for almost 20 years. So we've used this, th this technology has been demonstrated on the earth in laboratories uh, many, many times. Um, but if we're ever going to use this technology to, uh, for a human mission, in which case it's obviously a very critical technology. If, if you don't have the oxygen for your rocket to get off the surface of Mars, you're, you're in bad shape. Um, and NASA has a, a requirement for any critical technology or processes uh, you need to demonstrate them in the real environment where they're going to be used. And that means we've got to send MOXIE to Mars, not just demonstrate it in a laboratory here on Earth. So, so the technology that MOXIE is using has been under development for probably the best part of 20 years. MOXIE, the experiment itself, 
uh, has been developed since uh, 2014. Okay, wow, so many great questions from our audience. Um, I think that there was, there was so much um, in, this, in this presentation. Um, okay, oh, I have one about the helicopter. I know, I don't, I know it's not your, your project, but. No, I know something about it. I'll, how I'll does do the helicopter fly? Well, you are a professor of aeronautics. How does the helicopter fly on Mars if the air is so thin? Well, that's a very good question because in fact, the air, the atmosphere density near the surface of Mars is more or less equivalent to the atmospheric density on Earth at about 100,000 feet. And we don't fly helicopters at 100,000 feet. Um, what they've done here is uh, they've made the helicopter very light and they spin those two counter rotating blades really, really fast. And they generate enough lift that it should work. It's been demonstrated. Uh, they, they took a um, environmental chamber at Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, pumped it down so that the atmosphere was the equivalent density of Mars, and they flew the helicopter even though it's Earth gravity. And, and so if it can fly in a Mars atmosphere with Earth gravity, uh, it should be able to fly on Mars. And the Mars gravity is only about 38% of the Earth's gravity. Um, and they've shown that, that it, it, can, it can control itself. Because again, nobody's there on a joystick flying this thing because it takes you know, 10 minutes or five minutes or so to get a command to Mars. And it, you know, if you see something starting to go wrong, it takes five minutes before you see that and then five minutes before you make a correction. So you can't fly the helicopter like we fly uh, you know, <laughs> drones here on Earth it's got to be completely autonomous and be able to control itself. But it's been demonstrated uh, in, in the lab here on Earth and hopefully it'll work on Mars. And if it works, it will be a big step forward to help future exploration because you, know, you can put a helicopter up now and let's see what's on top of that next hill. Is, is it worth going over there to explore or do we want to go in that direction? And, um, you know, are there, are there any obstacles which we need to be aware of? I mean, just all sorts of things you can do. Uh, it's the ultimate high ground. So uh, we're all looking forward to it. Um, the helicopter will be demonstrated. Let, let me just give a very, very brief um, uh, timeline of what's going to happen once we land on Mars. Um, of course, people at Jet Propulsion Lab have to do a whole lot of checks to make sure that, that the rover landed safely, that nothing is broken. Then they're going to uh, turn on one by one all of the experiments. So just like we just turned on MOXIE yesterday uh, to make sure that it survived launch, we'll turn on MOXIE just like all the other experiments will we'll turn on just to make sure we survived the landing. We're not gonna, we're not gonna produce oxygen or, or anything. That'll be all done within the first few, well, I like to say days, but we don't call them days on Mars. We call them sols because a day sort of implies a 24 hour Earth day. And on Mars, uh, a Mars quote day is about 24 and a half hours. And we call it a sol after the sun. Anyway, that, that initial checkout will, will take a few sols then uh, we'll give each of the experiments the chance to check themselves out. So from Moxie's point of view, we will first turn on the compressor, make sure that it's working. We'll turn on the heaters to make sure that they're working. We'll turn on the voltage to make sure that that's working. And then we'll shut down and wait for a few more days until we get the go ahead. Uh, all right, Moxie, you're ready to produce oxygen. And so the hope is we'll, we'll land on the 18th of February, that we know. Uh, and the hope is that before early March, we will have produced oxygen. Uh, at that point, after the first month or so, most of the experiments are going to stop and we will devote ourselves to helicopter operations. So the helicopter will then 
be tested out. Um, and uh, after about 90 sols, then we'll be ready to start exploring. And, and then the, the rover will take off and start moving around and, and we'll start doing the geology and the, astro and the biology investigations. And roughly every month or so, we'll turn on MOXIE. What we wanna do with MOXIE is to demonstrate that we can operate and, and produce um, oxygen during any sea, all the seasons and all times of day. So, you know, summer, winter, fall, spring, day, night. So hopefully by the end of the first Mars year, which is the nominal, uh, what they call the approved mission for MOXIE, we, we, we will have run, you know, roughly 10 or so times. And then if things are going well, most uh, Mars rovers are given an extended mission. Uh, and if that happens, then uh, we may actually be able to leave the Jezero crater and explore other places on Mars. The one other thing which I did not mention, which uh, I would be derelict if I didn't, is that one of the most important and fascinating things that Perseverance is going to do for the very first time, uh, scientists have been for 20 years, uh, planetary scientists have said, the most important thing we need to do for the understanding of Mars and, and solar system history in general is to bring back a sample from Mars, just like the Apollo astronauts brought back lunar samples. And because we, the, the analytic capability that we have in laboratories here on Earth is so much greater than what we can do with the rover. I mean, there, yeah, there's, there's analysis that will be done on Mars, but we really need to get the Mars material, both the, the regolith and, and samples of rocks back here on Earth. So Perseverance actually has a system where they can take samples of Mars, put them in into sample uh, caching uh, canisters, hermetically seal them, and then basically leave a bunch of samples on the surface of Mars in a well-documented place and then in about hopefully five or six years, uh, NASA will send another mission, the so-called Mars Sample Return Mission in cooperation with the European Space Agency. And they will land, hopefully with precision landing near those samples, pick up the samples, put them in a Mars ascent vehicle, bring them into Mars orbit, and put them then into a, another vehicle, which will take them back to Earth and land them where they will be analyzed. And of course, we've got to be very careful because we don't want any contamination from the Earth to contaminate those samples because we want to make sure that they're pure Mars. And we don't want anything from Mars to contaminate the Earth in case it's very unlikely, but you know, if there is life on Mars, people worry about, you know, maybe there's some germs or something. And, and so we will keep those samples hermetically sealed until they get into a high containment laboratory where they will be. And the same thing was done with the lunar samples, of course. Uh, so we know how to do that, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's going to be one of the most exciting aspects of this mission. And, and, you know, hopefully by the end of the decade, maybe we'll have samples of Mars back here on Earth, which will be incredibly exciting. Okay, well, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna take two more questions. Um, I apologize to everyone who didn't quite get their question answered today. We will still have them, access to them, and you know, we'll think of something fun to do with all these questions. Um, I want the last question to be about MOXIE. So, so I'll put this one first. Um, the question is, were you on the ISS? And maybe just say a little bit about your, your uh, flight history. Uh, no, actually, um, I, I was a space shuttle astronaut. Um, and I made five flights on the space shuttle. In, um, the one most people may have, have heard about was, uh, I was one of the crew who went out in spacesuits to do the initial repair and rescue of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, to store its optics and, and which has produced all the incredible pictures and scientific results and, and really 
Um, and, and I should say, before I became an astronaut, I was an astronomer. So that was, that was one of the most exciting things I ever did, both as an astronomer and an astronaut, to put my own two hands and touch the Hubble telescope in space. That, that was the thrill of a lifetime. Uh, I was interested in, in spending time uh, on, on a space station. Uh, either I, I actually volunteered uh, to go up to the Mir space station when we were flying there. But the thing about the space station, up until recently, uh, the access to the, to the Mir and, and then to the International Space Station was by the Russian Soyuz. It turns out I'm, I'm several inches too tall to fit in the version of the Soyuz, which was available when I was an astronaut. It was, uh, and, and so I was too tall. So I, I could never get up to the space station or to the Mir. It's okay, I had a great career in space, but all of, all of my space activities uh, were on the uh, space shuttle. You know, I, I never really knew if that was true about the height thing. Yeah, I'm six foot two. And at the time, they've since, uh, Soyuz is now a little bigger. I'm, I'm just sort of at the hairy edge now, but you know, I'm not flying anymore. But back then uh, it was uh, about five foot 11 was, was the maximum height. And then, you know, I just couldn't fit. That was true by the way, in the early American program. I mean, Mercury astronauts, uh, it was the same kind of a height limit. And for Apollo, it was six feet. So. I, I would not have been able to fly uh, back back in those days. I was I was there at the right time. The shuttle you could be up to six foot four, so I was okay for shuttle. I think those of us who are a little shorter feel a little vindicated. <laughs> well, Much for shorter, shuttle, I would say. <laughs> for shuttle, you had to be at least five feet. That was the minimum. That was the minimum height. We and for so pilots, fluid. you had to be at least five foot four so that your feet could reach the, the rudder pedals. But for a mission specialist, scientist, you could be as small as five feet. All right, I think I'm gonna go with this last question that I've been thinking about as well. You've addressed it a little bit in your, in your presentation, but um, the question is, what challenges will you face in scaling up Moxie tech for, for human? Actually, yeah. The, the biggest challenge was in scaling down to the MOXIE size because the technology that MOXIE uses, this electrolysis, is very similar to a fuel cell. Um, it's just you, you change the voltage settings around and with a fuel cell, you can take uh, a, something like hydrogen and oxygen or you could take you know, carbon monoxide and oxygen uh, put them together to uh, release energy and, and uh, make carbon dioxide and produce electricity. Fuel cells, you know, we can make big fuel cells. It's, it's pretty, you know, people know how to do that. They've been doing it for, for a long time. And uh, the challenge for the company, it's called Oxion, they're a company out in Salt Lake City that actually made the electrolysis unit. They had made lots of large units uh, mostly fuel cells, but as I say, you can convert it to electrolysis fairly easily. The big challenge for them was shrink the whole system down to where it could fit inside the rover and operate on the limited amount of electrical power which we have available in the rover. So they are, they're currently, they have a contract with NASA to produce a human scale system and it's going very well. I've seen pictures of it. Uh, they know how to do that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, a little bit counterintuitive, but the hardest part of MOXIE was making it so small. <laughs> making it bigger will be relatively uh, easy. Uh, but whether it's big or small, you still have to demonstrate that there's nothing unexpected about the environment of Mars, which is going to uh, inhibit the uh, effectiveness. And, and that's what MOXIE is gonna demonstrate, that the technology works on Mars. We have every reason to expect that it will, but as I said, since it's a critical technology, we just have to demonstrate that Mars doesn't have any 
as we call it, are there unknown unknowns on Mars that will surprise us that we didn't think of? We don't anticipate any. And uh, hopefully six months from now, we'll be able to tell you that yes, in fact, Moxie worked and we produced oxygen. So stand by. Uh, sometime, hopefully late February, early March, you'll read in the newspapers that oxygen has produced on Mars, been produced on Mars. And you can go to your friends and say, I know all about it. I heard about it on the Mars mania. Uh, and so there we go. And we would be happy to invite you again to tell us more about the results. You know that I will ask. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, once, once we have results to talk about, uh, you know, scientists love to talk about their, uh, their, their experiments and their results. And uh, I hope I'll have something good to talk about. But we've got uh, those seven minutes of terror landing on Mars. Uh, we, we did it once with curiosity, but that doesn't, just because you, you do it once, I hope you got the... Uh, the basic message that an awful lot of things have to happen and, and go just right. And it's all automatic. We have no control over it. And so that's why when you see the picture, when, when they finally get confirmation by, uh, by telemetry that, that Curiosity or any of these other Mars landers are safely on the surface of Mars, everyone in, in the Jet Propulsion Lab mission control, you know, they all jump up and, you know, hug and kiss. And I, I don't know, maybe now in COVID times, there won't be quite so much hugging and kissing, but there, there's still gonna be a lot of celebration. You can, you can believe that. So stand by, February the 18th is when it's all gonna happen. Actually, I wanna ask everyone who's still with us, first of all, thank you. Um, I just want to, um, I want to put in the chat the, um, the event page for, um, for tonight's event, um, because if you did not get, if you had a question that didn't get answered, we've got tons of resources um, on the Mars 2020 mission, where you can learn more about the mission, the rover, you can learn more about Mars in general. I know we didn't get to talk that much about Mars. It's, you know, the science there. So check out that resource page. There's a lot there. Um, and maybe we'll even add to it as we go along. And yes, definitely continue to join us for Astro Nights, um, especially in February, when we'll definitely be talking about Mars again. Um, Dr. Hoffman, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, I think this was a perfect event to kick off STEM week with the theme, See Yourself in STEM, because I think that your presentation made me feel very excited about the mission to Mars, this one, and the ones in the future that are going to benefit so much from this research. And I think we can, you know, especially the young people here, I hope you can see how this is setting the groundwork for future missions to Mars. Great. Well, I All I can say is go Perseverance, go Moxie. Let's get to yes. Mars. All right. It's been a Thank pleasure you, talking with you all. And uh, yeah, keep tuning into these things. There's, uh, we're just scratching the surface here. There's, there's lots more to learn. So good night, everybody. And uh, be well. Have a good weekend. Good night. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you, everyone. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Thank for you. And yeah. Have me. Yeah, no, no, no. I want you to do it. There are.